11. Vicky. I can still feel his lips on mine two full days later. He's texted, but I haven't replied. I haven't gone so far as to block him yet, but I will if the texts continue. Since he's in a series of away games, I don't have to worry about him showing up at my school again this week. The events of the next few days are exactly why I know I made the right decision about not getting involved with Colt or someone famous. The buzz at school has yet to die down. It's all the staff and students can talk about. I'm bombarded with questions every time I step foot in the teacher's lounge, the hallway, or my classroom, but that doesn't even come close to the worst part. The worst part is the pictures that are floating on social media. Pictures of not just Colt, but of me. It took one day for my name to be revealed, and for my family's history to be written about. Not that the Taylors have anything to hide, but we do like our privacy. Someone managed to get my yearbook picture from high school. There was talk about my job as a teacher and my connection to Ethan Bradford through my sister. All boring stuff, and I can't understand why anyone would care or find any of it interesting. The things I did find interesting were the little articles written about Colt. The things that add context to what he's already told me about himself. He's the younger of two boys, and his brother is two years older than he is. His father died when he was 13 after suffering from a major heart attack. His brother, Charlie Chastain, was also a very gifted athlete and earned a basketball scholarship at the University of Alabama, but six weeks before he was supposed to move on campus, he was in an accident that shattered his right femur, and his plans of playing for a Division I school were also shattered. Two years later, Colt was offered that same opportunity and seized it before he was drafted into the NBA at the age of 20. The articles about him and his late wife are where everything I've always assumed about him was confirmed. Kelsey Bennett Chastain had known him all her life. She has a daughter from a previous marriage, so there's a story there. The surprising part, though, is that they married a couple of months before she had Evan. There are no articles about them dating. They were married a little over two years when she died. There's speculation that the couple was having marital issues, and there's even talk that he only married her because she was pregnant. One article goes so far as to suggest that Colt was going to leave her and that her death was a suicide. I spent hours looking at photos of them as a couple and as a family. Kelsey was a tall, long-legged brunette. In all her pictures, she was dressed in designer clothes and expensive shoes. I don't think she ever left the house without makeup. Her little girl, Mia, is her spitting image. In a few photos, they are dressed alike but I don't see any pictures of a baby or toddler Evan. After spending hours searching the internet like a rabid fangirl, I shut down my computer and do my best to put Colt out of my mind. What I said is true. I have no interest in dating a celebrity who is also a single father. Beyond that, he's not interested in me. He's interested in the challenge, and I'm not trying to be anyone's conquest. The rest of the week continues, and every night, I turn on the television to see how the home team is doing while on the road. I'd usually have it on in the background while I either work on my book or make plans for the summer. My summer plans are another reason why a relationship is not in the cards for me right now. I plan on spending a month in Atlanta, the hometown of one of my main characters. Family I slam my parents' front door and step inside. Why don't I smell anything cooking? The first floor is eerily quiet and dark for an early Friday evening in June. Are we ordering out? I yell from the bottom of the stairs but hear nothing back. Your child needs food. I open the blinds and peek outside. The backyard is empty. I sigh, open the fridge, and pour myself a glass of wine. It's smooth, and after taking another gulp, I finally look at the bottle. A French rose that I can barely pronounce. A quick glance in the fridge reveals two more bottles, then I remember that my sister and Ethan are still staying here. I finish my wine and refill my glass. I grab my phone to text my parents, when I hear footsteps coming down the stairs. There's a loud scream and male laughter. Get away, you ogre. 
Tara comes running through the living room in a see-through silk nightgown that barely reaches mid-thigh. Ethan follows behind her in black boxer briefs and nothing else. He reaches for her when she gets to the couch, snatching one of her arms, turns her around, and lifts her off her feet. She wraps her legs around him and crashes her mouth on his. Once the moaning starts, I let out a loud string of coughs, and he nearly drops her in their surprise. I arch an eyebrow while I sip my drink. Good evening, I say. Tara stands in front of him. I assume it's to block my view of his very broad chest. Oh, girl, please. I like them dark, I remind my sister. I give them my back and rummage through the fridge. Where's dad and the evil one? Ethan sent them to Tuscany for a week. I let out a loud whistle. When your man is a billionaire with his own plane, I guess that's nothing. I check my phone for the first time in hours. There's a text from dad telling me they were surprised with the trip and would be gone for a week. Well, there goes my evening. I look at my sister and her boyfriend. She's wrapped in his arms, neither of them caring about their state of undress while he leans down and whispers something in her ear. Come to dinner with us, Tara tells me. Where's Vincent? He's spending the night with my sister, Ethan says. I nod, finish my wine and grab my purse. In that case, I'm not about to crash your kid-free evening. But I am having a dinner party next Saturday. I'm introducing Hunter and Cody, and I want you two to come. Ethan snorts and Tara swats his bare chest. Hunter is Ethan's personal assistant, and Cody is a teacher at my school. Hunter is a big enough pain in the ass. I don't want to hang with him outside of work, Ethan complains. We'll be there, Tara says for them both. I see who wears the pants in this relationship. I high-five Tara on the way out. Neither one of you. Tara catches up to me, takes my elbow, and walks me to the door while Ethan runs up the stairs and out of sight. Are you going to watch Colt tonight? She wraps her arm around mine. Where have your hands been? I extricate myself from her, and she giggles but doesn't deny where her hands have been. I'm telling Dad, I joke. We were never allowed friends of the opposite sex in the house unless an adult was present. And that's a loaded question. Am I going to watch Colt's game? Hell no, but he's in so many commercials, I can't escape him whenever the TV is on. So, I'll probably have to put on some music tonight while I write. He's been asking about you. Come on. Are we back in high school? I'm all about black love and you know I'm not looking for a relationship right now. Especially with a person who can't take two steps without being stopped for an autograph. I cringe at the few things that were written about me. And did you know he's from, I lower my voice and say, Alabama? So? Tara shrugs. I wave her off. She's in love and won't see things from my point of view. People in love think the world is perfect and that everyone will find their soulmate too. He's a good guy, she says. I wave her off. Tara, he calls himself a southern gentleman who thinks alcohol is the devil's milk. That's code for boring control freak. And, I remind her, lowering my voice again, Alabama. You know what that means. I don't know what that means. Enlighten me. I roll my eyes and shake my head at her. Come on. You know. Know what? I sigh in frustration. Never mind. You're all in love and your head's in the clouds. Yes, I am. She runs a hand through my hair. I want you to be happy. I am happy. Weren't you happy before Ethan? I was, and I'm not saying you need a relationship to be happy, but I don't want you to close yourself off either. At least be open to the idea. Let someone penetrate that wall. I cackle at my sister. Is that what Ethan was just doing to you? Penetrating your walls? Honestly, I'm not closed off to anything. I'm not available now, and Alabama boys need not apply. 
I gesture at my body. Besides, I'm going to Atlanta for a month soon, and Colt is not the one. Trust me. Now, I'm going home. I'm going to order takeout and crack open my laptop. Enjoy your night. And I want you and Alan to come visit me for a few days in Atlanta. You can bring your family. I know she doesn't like to go far without Ethan and Vincent. I give her a tight hug and walk out, taking the short walk to my apartment building. The wine in my fridge isn't as good as the stuff at my parents, but it will have to do. I order Alexa to play soft music while I change into a pair of black yoga pants and a light blue t-shirt. By the time I turn on my laptop, my phone has dinged several times with incoming messages. Colt, will you be watching? I groan and toss the phone on the couch, but I pick it up and respond to his text. Me, shouldn't you be practicing or eating whole wheat pasta? Colt, so, you were listening. What are you doing? I pick up my glass of wine, take a picture of it and send it to him. Me, having some devil's milk on a Friday evening. I might do some cussing later. Or is it cussin'? Colt, as long as you don't do those things around mama. I text him and I roll emoji and put my phone away. It rings. He's sent me a FaceTime request. Uncaring about the state of my naked face, I answer, making sure to take a sip of my drink just as I hit accept. How come you haven't responded to my texts all week? Been busy. And I said it all when I saw you last. Did you? I don't remember. I miss you. Shocked by the admission, I finish my drink and put my glass down. I wipe my mouth with my arm. What do you miss? A lot of things, but right now, I'm missing your soft lips the most. And the way you moaned when I kissed you. Oh, really? Really? Tell me when I can see you. If you don't, I'll have to take matters into my own hands like I did before. There's a knock on my door, and I drop the phone on the couch. It takes only a few seconds for me to get my Chinese food from the delivery man. Colt is still on the phone when I get back. I'll be flying home tonight after the game. This is the last game in this series. We're getting that much closer to the finals. I stick my chopsticks in a container of chicken lo mein and nod, having no idea what series he's talking about. There's always an endless supply of games. Sounds awesome. I want you to come to my next home game. Aww. Thanks, but I'm on a tight schedule. I have a book to finish, and no offense, but I find basketball incredibly boring, not to mention useless. No offense taken, Darland thought. He smiles so wide, that dimple appears. That's because you've never had someone to root for. Can I read your book? You can buy it when it's published. Sure. Okay, forget it then. I don't miss you. He blows out a breath and pretends to be mad. He goes so far as to pout. One of the few things we have in common. Don't even think of kissing me again. I didn't kiss you. You kissed me, and it was terrible. He flashes that sexy smile, the one that shows off that dimple. Your moans told a different story. I bet you wish you were kissing on me right now. I give him a blank stare. Truth is, I do wish I was kissing on him now, not that I'll ever admit it. He looks so sexy with that curly dark hair. And those dark eyes make me want to drag him into my bedroom and climb him like the tree he is. Darlin', he says, breaking me out of my dirty thoughts. I'm right here. I clear my throat and put a hand on my warm cheek. All right, I have to go now. I wave right before I end the call, cutting off whatever he was going to say next. The phone rings again, but when I pick it up, it's not Colt. It's the same number that called me a few weeks ago. It's Jerry. I hit decline and put the phone on silent. 12. Colt. Chastain. Wachowski shouts. He throws a ball and it hits me on the butt. I tell him to buzz off.
but when I look back to the phone, the screen has turned black. What the heck, Wachowski? I shove past him on my way to my locker. It's the seventh game, so we need to win to advance to the next series. Who is that? The only woman you talk to is your mama. I give him a hard stare, but he smiles and shrugs. He's been on this team for just a year now. Immature idiot. Come to my hotel room after the game. There's going to be some serious partying. He does a shuffle and pretends to shoot a basketball. Every city, every hotel room, he has a different woman. Sometimes, he has more than one at a time. I'll pass, I tell him. Chase Chastain. I hate that nickname. It's as if I'm supposed to be ashamed because I don't screw anything in a skirt. At least not anymore, but when I was screwing everything in a skirt, the team didn't know about it. You into black women now? I tense at the question, but I don't bother answering him. Am I into black women? I'm into one woman and she happens to be black. He wiggles his eyebrows at me. She's cute. Let me have her if you're not interested. I look up at him, ready to pound his face through a wall. Yeah? Is that how it works? Just pass her off to you as if she has no say. Vicky would rip his face off in seconds. He gives me that cocky grin and ignores my question. This, he gestures at his body, leaving both hands at his crotch, is equal opportunity. He thrusts his hips twice then grinds, mimicking making slow love to a woman. My dick is colorblind. All it sees is pussy. He thrusts again and lets out a high giggle like an adolescent girl. One day, pussy is going to bring that idiot to his knees, Coach Walsh says after walking into the locker room. I'm not the one who gets on their knees, Coach. He laughs like a raving lunatic as we're called out to the court. Coach taps me on the shoulder, looking relaxed right before a big game. I guess he released the stress earlier in the gym. I've never seen someone bench press so much weight. You good coach? I tap his shoulder. That workout earlier, I leave the sentence unfinished. All he does is nod. Coach is not one to ever talk about anything that's not related to his job. We're away tonight, so as we're called out one by one, the crowd stays quiet. A couple of our players are booed but that's not unexpected on a night like this. This game determines if we can proceed into the next series. There's a lot at stake, and I wish we were playing in New York and not on the other side of the country where I'm away from home, but more importantly, away from my son. The lights in the stadium dim as they announce the home team. The crowd goes wild. My heart rate picks up as I anticipate the next three hours. There's only one way this game can end and it's with us winning and the mischiefs moving to the conference finals. Over three hours later, during overtime, Wachowski throws the final basket, winning us the game, and pushing us forward into the next round. 13. Vicky. Me, it's a success. Too bad I'm disowning both of you. I barely have time to put my phone down and pour myself a glass of wine before it buzzes again. It's a rich, flavorful Zinfandel, sent by Ethan as an apology for not coming tonight. Not that it was necessary since they are all sick, but that won't stop me from indulging. Tara, trust me. You don't want any of this. She sends a picture of her, Ethan, and Vincent in bed under a blanket. For three sick people, they sure look happy. Alan, hashtag not sorry for not being my twins plus one at her own dinner party. Got too much street cred for that. You know I'm the one who ordered that and had it sent to you, right? Hunter, one of my guests, yells from across the room. He's Ethan's personal assistant, and when we first met, I promised to introduce him to my colleague, Cody. I grab the bottle, walk over and fill their glasses. Well done, Hunt. I put the bottle down to give him a high five. Cody drinks his in one gulp and lets out a loud giggle. Dinner's over. We had the food I ordered, including dessert. We're currently on our second bottle of red. 
my guests have gotten cozier with each passing second. There's practically no room between them and I give myself a mental high five for my amazing matchmaking skills. I dim the lights and return to the kitchen, busying myself with cleanup. I turn up the music to give them privacy, even though I have the feeling they will be leaving soon. I check my phone again, then remind myself that there's no game tonight. The mischiefs won the last one, and according to my dad, they are going to the conference finals. If they win that series, they will move on to the NBA finals, and hopefully bring another championship to the city of New York. I was irritated two years ago when they won. The city was not only flooded with people, but with trash. Major streets were blocked off and the subway was packed with fans. And worse, my daytime TV lineup was interrupted for the stupid parade. You too want some more of this dessert? I give the cupcakes the side eye, knowing full well I will eat most of them if they don't. No, Chica, Hunter says. I'm watching my figure. Looks pretty good to me, Cody responds. Well, one of you take them home because, my words are interrupted by a loud, determined knock. No one rang the bell, and for a split second, I think it's my mother bulldozing her way into my Friday night. Then, I think better of it. Mother wouldn't waste a Friday on one of her kids. She'd spend it with friends unless they bailed on her. But she's been trying. You won't let her in. The unknown guest knocks again, and I put down the plate and walk to the door. I look through the peephole but don't see anyone. Thinking it's one of the kids from across the hall playing a prank, I walk away, only to hear the knock again. I open the door to check the hallway, and Colt jumps in front of me from the side of the wall. I gasp and put a hand to my heart. He laughs, wraps his arms around me as if it's his right and pulls me into a hug. I hate to admit it, but he smells great. His body is a wall of muscle, and I want nothing more than to lean into it all night, but I pull myself away and make the horrible mistake of looking into his face. His hair is still a curly mess, and I reluctantly admit that I'm glad he didn't cut it. My fingers are dying to run through it and fix it, but I'm pretty sure it's untamable. Queen Victoria He takes my hand and wraps it around one of his huge ones. I try to pull away, but it's no use. He puts our joint hands on his chest and says, My lady. He drops my hand and does an exaggerated and awkward bow. I have come to conquer thy heart and thine lips. He bows again, and he loses his balance, almost falling over. I cover my mouth with my hand to muffle my laugh. Shakespeare, my lady. When he gets to his full height, he gives me a salute. I've read all his work, and he never said anything like that. Are you going to let me in? He cranes his neck to look inside my apartment before walking a few feet down the hall and returning with a bouquet of flowers. He pulls out a red rose and hands it to me. For my lady. I move aside and let him in. We walk past Hunter and Cody, who are now holding hands on my couch. They are so busy gazing at each other that neither of them is phased by the almost seven-foot-tall man in the house. He puts the flowers on my table and stares at me. Unable to look into his eyes for a second longer, I look away and say, I'd offer you some wine, but Mama might not approve. He tilts his head to the side and waits for me to say more. Devil's milk, I remind him. I'll tell Mama you remembered. She'll be pleased. He winks at me and looks around my kitchen. He takes my hand and pulls me into his body. I've been thinking about this since the last time I saw you, even though you haven't texted me back in days. Soft music plays and he sways slowly with me in the kitchen, making me forget about my guests until one of them clears their throat. Vicky, thanks for dinner, but we're going to go. Hunter invited me for a drink at his place. My guests hug me and practically run out of the apartment. You sure know how to clear a room, I tell Colt. He looks around my place, running his hand on my counter. He even opens my fridge and looks inside. It's as if he's trying to learn as much about me as possible. Do you want some dinner? He walks behind me and puts his hands on my hips. 
he kisses the side of my neck and I almost combust in my kitchen. It's been months since I've enjoyed the touch of a man and it wasn't that memorable the last time it happened. I lean into him and tilt my head to the side to give him better access. I tell myself that it's not the man that's causing the erratic beating of my heart or the dampening of my panties. It's just a need for the human touch. I crave to be touched, and Colt has good hands. Strong, firm hands. Yeah, I want dinner. I'm starving. His hands come to my shoulders and slowly travel down my arms, almost making me shudder. I pull away, breaking the spell he's trying to cast on me. It would be too messy. He's friends with my sister. He's famous, and pictures are taken of him every time he leaves the house. He's a father to a small boy, and there's no part of me that wishes to date outside of my race. Relationships are messy enough. Why add complications when they can just as easily be avoided? But dinner with a man? I can do that. I pull out the roasted chicken from inside the oven and put it on the table. And because I know he's on a strict eating regimen, I get the shaved Brussels sprouts and offer them to him. I offer to heat it for him, but he declines and proceeds to eat practically an entire chicken while I indulge in another glass of wine. How did you know I'd be home tonight? I ask. Stopped by to see Ethan, and he mentioned feeling bad about cancelling. Now, I feel bad that I wasn't invited. Couples only. And me, of course. Why of course? Because you don't do the couple thing? At least for now. I'm taking a break from dating. I've decided I like my single life and have wasted enough time trying to find the one. No such thing. I'm just going to live my life and enjoy every minute of it. He shoves a huge piece of chicken breast in his mouth and chases it with half a bottle of water. Sounds nice. You want to make God laugh? Make plans. That's what Mama always says. Why do you bring up your mother in every conversation? I lean in my seat and add, I must say, that's a huge red flag. Don't change the subject, Queen. Your plan was working until the plot twist. He uses his hands to scoop the vegetables and shove them in his mouth. You should put that in your book, he says with his mouth full. A big plot twist. You don't have to give me any credit. You're welcome. And what plot twist would that be? I grab a napkin and hand it to him. I have a feeling I know what he's going to say, and I'm proven right when he opens his mouth. Me Colt the Bolt Chastain. I can no longer resist the urge to laugh. I pull out the chair across from him and sit. Cocky, aren't you? He wiggles his brows. Very. I lean forward and put both elbows on the table. Where is your son, Cole? He surprises me when he takes hold of my hand. His touch is warm and a shock to my system. I do my best to appear unaffected, but when I try to pull my hand away, he holds on. I really, really love how you always make it a point to ask about him. For someone who doesn't like kids, you sure are thoughtful when it comes to mine. First off, what gives you the impression that I don't like kids? I love them. And I'm not being thoughtful. I'm judging you. Here you are on a Friday night, eating all my leftover food when I know for a fact you probably just got home from the West Coast. Shouldn't you be spending time with him right now? You've been gone for days. Oh, darlin, I love it when you keep track of me. He lifts my hand and kisses it, surprising me yet again tonight. But he's spending the night with his maternal grandmother. I fly her in once a month so she can see him. Is that okay, with you? I shrug. No skin off my nose. I pull my hand away and stand up. My throat is suddenly dry, so I grab a bottle of water. I don't hear him move, but he's suddenly standing behind me, the heat of his body like a burning inferno. Stop pretending, I thought. He turns me around, and I crane my neck to look at him. I'm not pretending at anything. 
He runs a hand through my hair, which I've had flattened earlier. Long fingers stroke my skull. You're a bad liar, but I still like you. Everyone likes me. I bet they do. I'm leaving for Milwaukee on Sunday. I have meetings and practice tomorrow. I wait and stare, doing my best to pretend like I don't understand what he's saying. I won't be back this way until Wednesday for the remainder of this series, and when we win, we'll go to the finals. I look down and try to move away, but he holds on to me. Let's have tonight, and when the season is over, we'll have the summer. It would be so easy to give in to that. Spend the night together, and the summer. Lose myself in this man and his bigger-than-life persona. I imagine how that would look. The three of us enjoying a carefree time at the beach or hiking in a foreign country. Then I remember I have my own plans, which I would not change for anybody, let alone with a man who's only interested because I told him no. There's also the added complication of his kid hating me. I won't be here for the summer. I'm spending most of it in Atlanta, then we have our annual family vacation. Dad and the evil one have a house in the Outer Banks. You know, I can travel. I do it pretty frequently. But you're not invited. Oh, darling. You underestimate me. He smiles and steps away. Just like he did the first time he came to my family home, he clears the table. He takes it a step further and loads the dishwasher too. Once everything is put back in order, he takes my hand and leads me to my couch. He takes the remote, but instead of turning on the television, he plays soft music. I thought you'd put on ESPN and watch the highlights from the game. See, that's what you get for making assumptions about me. I already have that on my phone. The only sport I watch for fun is football, and maybe baseball. Throw in a little hockey too. I don't hate soccer either. That's it, but for now, all I want is to sit here with you and talk. He lifts my hand to his lips and kisses it. So, you watch pretty much all the sports? I roll my eyes. Boring. I'm well-rounded, he counters. You have women falling at your feet everywhere you go. Why me? Why the one who has made it clear she's not interested? You're wasting your time. You mean the women from my mama's church that she wants to fix me up with? Or Robin, my dead wife's sister? I look into his face in surprise, certain that he's exaggerating. Oh, it's true. She wanted to take her sister's place. Full disclosure. I told her there wasn't a snowball's chance. Just so you know, I haven't dated much since my wife died. I sit next to him on the couch, and his eyes land on my breasts. My sundress has spaghetti straps and shows off a good amount of cleavage. He reaches over and traces a finger along my collarbone. It's one simple gesture, but he's managed to ignite my entire body. The thin, thong panties I have on start to dampen. I move away from him, but he inches closer. He puts an arm around me and runs his nose along the side of my neck. One kiss, he whispers close to my ear. He kisses and licks the shell, almost making me combust. One, and if you hate it, you tell me to leave. He turns my face to his, but I jump off the couch before our lips can touch. We've already kissed. I stand against the kitchen island with my back turned to him. I do everything to keep my breathing under control, but he hasn't only invaded my apartment. He's invaded me too. I didn't care for it, I lie. I've thought about it non-stop since it happened. I feel him against my back. He's pressing himself to me, pinning me to the island. Large hands grab my hips and firm lips return to the side of my neck. I tilt my head to give him full access. A wanton moan escapes my lips, and those hands leave my hips and travel forward, but he spins me around to face him. He looks into my eyes and bites his full bottom lip. Your eyes give it all away every time, queen. One kiss. I can hear the challenge in his voice. Unless you're afraid you won't be able to stop. 
I'm not naive enough to fall for that shameless attempt at reverse psychology. Hmm. His long nose inhales at the base of my neck. He slides his hands up my dress and glides his long fingers along my thighs. Kiss me. Just once. I dare you. He lifts me off my feet, forcing me to look down at him. Wrap those legs around me. There's nothing I love more than wrapping my legs around a strong man while he holds me up. Gerald was the last man I did that with. Wrap them around me. I know you want to. And I do. It's like coming home. We're a perfect fit, and it hits me that this man is dangerous. He looks up but doesn't inch closer. He waits, and I admire those plump, full lips. I imagine putting my mouth on his and sucking that fat bottom lip into my mouth. And because it's been years since a man has held me like this, and because his brown eyes are like magnets, drawing me closer, I lean down. It's like an implosion of my senses. Everything gets scrambled, and I forget who I am and who I'm with. One kiss. Just one kiss. That won't be enough. I'll need one night of kisses to purge him from my system. He smells so good, and feels so familiar that I close my eyes for a few seconds and just breathe him in. Right before I lower my mouth to his. 14. Colt. She offers no more resistance. At least for the moment, but I know that's subject to change on a whim. She feels so soft and warm in my arms that my body automatically reacts. I open my mouth to her, tasting her. It's been too long. I promise myself that we'll never go this long again without touching. It's been over a year since I've been with a woman. When things ended with Wendy, I decided I was going to focus on my son first, then my career. Everything else would take a back seat, especially dating. I didn't have a good track record there. My marriage was a disaster. Wendy only wanted me, not Evan. I thought there would be nothing else but the occasional one-night stand, until I laid my eyes on Victoria. I wasn't looking for a relationship the night we met. And as pretty as she was when I first saw her, I wasn't looking for anything, but her disinterest and dismissal intrigued me. So, when she sighs and relaxes into me fully, I decide to pull the rug out from under her and say, I like you. The room goes deathly quiet. I expect her to speak right away. I expect her to dismiss it. Roll her eyes and tell me that I'm only trying to get in her pants, but she doesn't. When she looks down at me, I see something I've never seen before from her. I see a little vulnerability, which she quickly erases in the blink of an eye. The unguarded expression disappears and the girl I met those first few times returns. The feeling is definitely not mutual. Her tone is light, almost teasing. She runs her hands through my hair. I've never liked that before. Not until this very moment. And stop it. Darlin', I can't stop nature. I know she can feel how much I want her. There's no hiding it, not that I would. I want her to know. Liking me. It won't end well for you. I let out a laugh. Really? What are you going to do about it? Beat me up? When you like someone, you can't just make it stop. Oh, please. Shut up. She kisses me. It's a kiss shared between two lovers. Like two lovers reuniting after time apart. It's a kiss full of carnal promises to come. I glide my hand down her body and cup her ass. There's not much there, but I give it a good squeeze with my large hands. The dress bunches at her waist, and I slide my hands underneath. Her ass is bare, and I pull her thong aside and trace my fingers along the crack of her ass. She moans in my mouth and deepens the kiss. Her fingers are now tangled in my hair, and I never want her to stop touching me. She reaches down and pulls my shirt up. I break the kiss only long enough for her to pull it over my head. Her hands caress and explore the naked skin on my back. Damn it, Colt, she moans. 
she's annoyed by this inferno between us, but it's the best thing that's happened to me since my son was born. I pin her against the wall in the kitchen and hold her with one hand. I remove her panties with the other, never once breaking the kiss. Her bare flesh presses against my stomach, coating me with her juices. I pull the neckline of her dress down, and when one of her breasts pops out, I take a brown nipple in my mouth. I always knew you'd taste good. I bite it, and she lets out a little shriek of surprise. I bite it again. She pulls my hair in retaliation. I told you the first night we met, I like a little pain with my pleasure. She pulls again, and I take her in a savage kiss. I undo my belt and pull my pants down. I spring free. Hands wrap around me, and I sigh at the sensation. It's been so long that I could combust and come in her hand, but I'd rather be inside of her. Fuck me, she orders. Do it now before I die. Her hands find my butt. God, you have a tight ass. She slaps it and digs her nails into my flesh. The stinging sensation makes me harder. I press into her. Makes me want to bite it, she whispers. She takes my bottom lip between her teeth and bites down. I make a mental note to give my personal trainer a raise. I find her warm heat and sink two fingers inside. Oh, God, yes, she purrs in my ears. She starts to grind on my skin, likely looking for relief. You should know that this isn't. Yeah. I get it. This isn't anything. One night. Colt, and it stays between us. She kisses me deep, sucking on my tongue and moaning into my mouth. Now. Right now. I don't think I can wait to take her into her bedroom. She grinds and I feel her clit on my stomach. I'm completely coated with her now. I inch her down, and she slides onto me, inch by inch. It takes all my willpower not to come instantly. I hold her against the wall and thrust into her. Oh, fuck, she groans. That's way more than I was expecting. I stop, giving her time to get used to my size. She's small, and I'm big and thick. Don't stop. Fuck me. And I do. I ram into her, slamming her into the wall. She grinds onto me, screwing me back. She's wet and hot and I fit inside of her just right. I forget everything and kiss her so deep, I don't know where I end and she begins. Those sharp fingernails dig into my ass, giving me just the right combination of pleasure and pain. She convulses, cursing into my mouth and biting my bottom lip as she comes. I'm so close, ready to let go inside of her tight, warm sheath, then I remember I didn't bother with a condom. I pull out just in time to spurt on the floor. I grab myself and strings of cum hit her upper chest. She slides down my body, her wetness leaving streaks down my stomach and upper thighs. I kick my pants off, but I grab the pack of condoms from my pocket. I toss her over my shoulder and run to her bedroom. We fall on the bed, and I do my best not to crush her. With both of us naked, I rest between her spread legs and kiss those lips. Hours later, I spoon her, and I feel her body tense at the closeness. I push that feeling aside and plant a loud kiss on her shoulder. I push her hair out of the way and kiss her long neck. The moonlight gives the room a golden hue, and I sigh in contentment. I don't remember the last time I was so relaxed with a woman. Maybe I've never been. There have always been too many expectations of me to ever fully be relaxed. When I was in high school, it was the expectations of the professional league, and eventually, the money and celebrity that would yield. When I made it into the NBA, the women I met never wanted to get to know me. They wanted the athlete. When Kelsey came into my life again, I held on to her. She was familiar. I'd known her since we were kids. I thought I understood her expectations of me, but that was all a lie too. Kelsey had changed, and not for the better, but I didn't figure that out until it was too late. I've never been with someone who had their own career, their own money, and who has already made their own path in life. 
those responsibilities have always fallen on me. Victoria doesn't want or need anything from me, and that's freeing. I kiss the back of her neck and start to feel myself getting hard again. She sighs and slowly turns to face me. She looks well loved. Her cheeks are flushed, and the expression on her face is relaxed and happy. I glide a finger down her neck and down her sternum. My queen, my leech, I whisper in my fake British accent. I cast you away, peasant, she says back. Unlike me, her British accent is much better. You're not worthy of being in the presence of royalty. I throw myself at the mercy of my queen. She giggles, and the sound is melodic. I pull her closer and kiss her soundly. This is the best Friday night I've had in years. Well, you have the privilege of being amongst your queen. She laughs, and then her face changes. The laughter dies on her tongue and the cool relaxed look disappears. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought I had imagined it. She breaks my stare and clears her throat. I put a finger to her chin and discover she has a cleft. I tilt her head up so she can look at me. Where'd you go? She moves her head, and I drop my hand. Suddenly the warmth in the room is replaced with a cold chill. I have to get up early tomorrow. You should go. She rolls away and climbs out of the bed, leaving me confused. Your curiosity was piqued, but now that you got what you wanted, she doesn't finish her statement. I stand and walk behind her. I rest both hands on her shoulders and slowly turn her around. She holds my stare briefly before looking away. Who hurt you? I whisper. She looks up at me in surprise, and I see a flash of softness, but it's gone in an instant. Stick to basketball, not psychoanalysis. She tries to pull away, but she weighs next to nothing, and I easily restrain her. You think I do this kind of thing all the time? Don't you? No, I say simply. I don't. I'm here because I like you. I pull her into my body and wrap my arms around her. You're short. Did anyone ever tell you that? I ask to lighten the mood. She snorts into my chest, and the heaviness dissipates. Everyone is short next to you, Gumby, or do you prefer string bean? And for the record, I'm not short. I'm the tallest woman in my family. She puffs out her chest in pride at that declaration. I also notice she's pulled herself to her full height, which is not much. Gumby? String bean? I step away. Look at this Greek god before you, my queen. You might be royalty, but you're mortal. You're amongst a god. I strut around, doing my best to show off my muscles. Oh, my lord. Forgive me. My mortal brain didn't realize it was amongst a god. I bow dramatically and kiss her hand. You know what I haven't done in a long time? What's that? Watch a movie with a girl I like. I think that takes her by surprise. She blinks three times. God, you're so boring. You want me to pop you some popcorn too? But she laughs and goes into a walk-in closet. She returns in gray yoga pants and a matching crop top. Her bare feet hit the hardwood, and I admire her red nail polish. She straightens the bed and says, Are you just going to stand there? I thought you wanted to watch a movie. She walks out of the room while I remain in all my naked glory. She returns seconds later and throws my clothes at me. I put on my boxer shorts and tee, but don't bother putting the jeans back on. Something tells me she would be mad about me leaving my jeans on her floor, so I leave them right where they are, her anger be damned. I find her in the kitchen putting popcorn in the microwave. She points to the couch and says, Gentleman's choice. I'm already cringing. I bet you're going to pick something boring. Maybe a documentary on the history and evolution of basketball. She dramatically cringes. I walk to her and kiss the top of her head. I said movie, not documentary. She smirks and goes to her fridge. 
I'm going to make you a charcuterie board filled with vegetables and protein. I smile, happy at the sweet gesture. Let's see if you can find something that won't put me to sleep in five minutes, but knowing what I know about you, I doubt it. A man can get used to this, I say while I dramatically drop myself on her couch. A smart man wouldn't. Who says I'm smart? Good point. All you do is dribble a ball. That doesn't take much brain power, I'm sure. Do you know how many times I've been hit on the head with a basketball? Too many to count. And where's my food? Hurry up, woman. I'm not here to watch a movie by myself. I pat the seat next to me, and she holds up her knife and starts to dramatically cut something on a cutting board. I flip through her channels and decide on a classic. A James Bond movie that me and my brother would watch with our dad. She puts the board on the ottoman in front of me and gestures for me to eat. She goes and returns with water for us both. No more wine? Mama would be pleased, I tease. She tenses and then bursts into laughter. I don't worry about pleasing my own mama. I'm not worried about yours. I put a hand to my heart, and she surprises me when she grabs a piece of cheese and puts it to my mouth. I let her feed me, and make sure to kiss her fingers. You should be worried about pleasing mama. She's very protective of me. At least she is now after the Kelsey debacle. She will want to vet you and make sure you're okay for her precious son. She makes a gagging noise and goes so far as to stick her finger down her throat. Victoria Renee Taylor does not get vetted by anyone. I'd tell your mama where to stick it. She grabs a slice of cucumber and eats it while giving me a devious smile. So, you're saying you're okay with meeting her? Good, good. I pat her head, and she shoves my hand away. Absolutely not. I already know what she'll think of me, not that I'd care. Oh, and pray tell, Queen V. What would she think? I have a feeling I know what she's going to say, but I want to hear the words from her lips. She'll say, Colton, what are you doing with that black girl? She does a high-pitched voice and an exaggerated southern accent. Why I do declare, son. Then she puts the back of her hand to her forehead and pretends to faint. Go fetch me a mint julep. I laugh so hard I hold my stomach. She punches my shoulder, but she laughs too. I sit up and pull her into my side. I kiss her temple, holding her close. She'd say, Colton, why that Victoria Taylor is as pretty as a picture and sweet as pie. We'll never meet, so I guess I'll never know. We'll see about that. Queen V only does what Queen V wants. Remember that. But Colton always gets his way. Remember that. 15. Vicky. We watch two James Bond movies, the same ones I've watched with my dad and Alan. After the second one ends, he picks me up and carries me to the bedroom. I was expecting him to put me down and leave, but he undresses and climbs into the bed next to me. He pulls me close and kisses me senseless before removing my clothes. We take our time and make slow, sweet love to each other. He stares into my eyes the entire time, loving me with his body. I eventually close my eyes to escape his intensity. Last night, he set my body and sheets on fire, but I refuse to let him get in my head. I reach over to his side of the bed. Well, it's technically my side, but he took it and I was too turned on to tell him otherwise. The pillow is cold against my hand. I sigh. I should be relieved. I never bring men to my house because I want to be able to leave when I want. I should be glad that he left before I woke up, but there's a part of me that's disappointed. I shove that down, unwilling to let it come back to the surface. There are only four people on this earth who can disappoint me, and I know they never will. No one else gets a chance. No one else gets close, and that's just the way I like it. Last night was about sex and nothing else. It had been months since I'd been intimate with a man, and there was a handsome man standing in front of me, wanting me. 
If I run into him, I'll be polite and distant. I've done it before with men I've slept with, and I can do it again. I lay on my back and stretch. I roll out of bed, still naked, and walk to my closet for my robe. Once it's tied at my waist, I look at my reflection in the mirror. My hair's a mess and in desperate need of a brush, but my cheeks are flushed, and my skin appears vibrant. As I start to walk out of my bedroom, I hear a commotion. I tiptoe to my door. I pull the top of my robe closer as if that would offer protection and look around my room for a weapon. There's nothing, and I'm kicking myself for my minimalistic lifestyle. I'm jolted when I hear another noise. It sounds like a pot or pan hitting the floor. I slowly open my door and tiptoe down the hall. I open the guest room and run to the closet, but the only weapon I can find is a small, yellow umbrella. I continue my trek down the hall and jolt at the sound of another crash. This one is so loud, I almost drop the umbrella. I peek around the corner and spot Colt in his boxer shorts rummaging through my fridge. He pulls out a packet of bacon and throws several pieces on a hot skillet. Unless it's going to start raining in here, I don't think you'll need that umbrella. I stand a little dumbfounded at the sight. My immaculate kitchen is a mess. There are three skillets on the stovetop and a bowl on the counter. There are also eggshells and yolk on my pristine floor. I cross my arms and stare at him for an explanation. Oh, stop it with that look. You couldn't scare a fly with that. He looks around the room and puts his hands on his hips. Okay, so I can't cook. Well, I can make bacon and scrambled eggs, but that's all. I was trying to bring you breakfast in bed, but maybe I should have had something delivered. He lets out a breath and takes a seat as if he's already exhausted. The skillet on the stove starts to smoke, and I walk over and turn the fire off. I slip on the egg yolk on the floor, but he grabs me, and I end up on his lap. What the hell, Chastain? I reach for a paper towel to wipe the egg off my foot. I meant well. I promise. His arm tightens around me. Yes, and now my kitchen is a disaster. You feel good, do you know that? He runs his nose along the side of my neck, reawakening my body. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, I hear. Don't fret, my queen. He stands abruptly. He still has his arm around my waist, which is holding me up and keeping my feet from touching the ground. He walks me to the back of the house and into the master bathroom. He doesn't let me go until he puts me inside the shower. In you go. I'll order us something while you wash up. I take off my robe and hand it to him. I don't miss the way his eyes darken at the sight of my naked body. I gesture for him to leave, and he does. When he's gone, I step out, put on my shower, and step back in. Another reason why getting together with him is a bad idea. A black man would have known better. I shower quickly, and when I step out, it's to the sound of loud whistling. I know the song. Dad and the Evil One play it all the time. It's an old Lionel Richie song called Easy. By the time I'm dressed in a long maxi dress, the whistling has stopped. I'm pleased to see my kitchen has returned to its pristine order, and Colt is wiping down the counter when I approach. So, he begins. He pulls out a chair for me and gestures for me to sit. I need to leave soon. I have a session with my personal trainer, and I have practice and a team meeting. The first two games are tomorrow and Monday. He pours a mug of coffee and hands it to me. He goes back to the fridge and hands me a carton of half and half. Sugar, sugar. He laughs as if he told a joke. I nod yes, and he goes to my pantry and returns with it. I see you've made yourself at home, I joke. Indeed. He pours himself his own coffee. Now, back to what I was saying a dot. Were you saying something? He opens his mouth to respond, but we're interrupted by a knock on the door. He jogs to answer it and returns seconds later holding a plastic bag. While he rummages through the bag, I get an alert on my phone. 
I glance at it, and it's an email I've been waiting for. I scan the first few sentences, then my shoulders sag in disappointment. I close my eyes and sigh. Then I toss the phone across the table. Bad news? He approaches and rests a hand on my shoulder. Don't worry about it, nosy. He scratches his head and stares down at me. I'm worried. He cups my face. My imagination is running wild. I'm thinking, you gave all your money to a Nigerian prince and now you need me to bail you out. I swear, Victoria. I roll my eyes and shove his hands away, but he takes both of mine in his. Or someone is holding Alan for ransom. Is that it? Don't worry. I'll bust in there, Anne. Oh, will you stop? It's nothing like that. Then what, darling? He cups my face again. You can tell me. Let's see. What can it be? He looks at the ceiling as if he's deep in thought. You just found out the family dog you had as a kid didn't run away to a farm like your daddy told you. He sits and pulls me into an awkward hug. I had the same thing happen to me. I don't want you to blame your daddy for this. Oh, will you shut up? I applied to teach English in Mexico next year, and I wasn't chosen. Are you always so melodramatic? He sits across from me and puts a hand to his chest. He loudly exhales in relief. I'm sorry, queen, but the selfish part of me wants you here. He kisses both of my hands. We still would have made it work, though. He returns to the bags, and I swear I hear him say under his breath, My lady speaks Spanish. He moves around my kitchen as if he lives here. He seems to know where I keep everything. So, do you speak any other languages? He asks while he pours me another cup of coffee. I'm fluent in French and Spanish. French? Oh, la la. He wiggles his eyebrows. We'll stop off in Paris on our way to Madrid. He puts a plate of food in front of me, kisses my temple, and sits. My stomach growls at the sight of scrambled eggs, bacon, and potatoes. Thank you, I tell him with an appreciative smile. I'm sure this is much better than whatever you were going to make. I decide to ignore everything he said about us traveling together. That's why I believe in specialization. He picks up his eggs with his hands and shoves the entire thing in his mouth. He bursts into laughter when he sees the disgust on my face. He wipes the side of his mouth with his fingers. You're gross, I tell him while I pick up a piece of bacon and put it to my mouth. So, my games? I'll have my assistant call you with all the arrangements. I'll send a car for you. And a few of my jerseys, of course. He sips his coffee while I stare at him, wide-eyed. What about the away games? I know it's the end of the school year, but if you can manage it, let Kendall know. Who the hell is Kendall? Kendall is my assistant, and he, he emphasizes he, will take care of everything. He sighs and takes my hand, causing me to drop my bacon. I must say, that little bout of jealousy was unexpected, but not the least bit unappreciated. I snort and pull my hand from his. That wasn't jealousy. That was me wondering out loud why you're sitting here in my kitchen giving me orders. That's what that was. I poke his chest with my index finger to make my point. Your kitchen, your rules. Yeah, I nod. Fuck. Yeah, he flinches but says, fine. Next time, you'll stay with me, and I'll be the one giving the orders while Myra cooks breakfast. He puts his fingers to my lips. Myra is my 55-year-old cook. No need to be jealous. I swat his hand away and say, don't flatter yourself, and I don't want to go to your games. This, I say, gesturing between us, is not a relationship. Are you trying to pressure me into a commitment, Victoria? I never took you for the manipulative type, but if a relationship is what you. I put a finger to his lips to silence him. He kisses my finger and playfully bites it. 
While I gather my thoughts, he takes my plate of food and starts to eat it. I don't do relationships, I remind him. Right. Of course, not. But, you see, the thing is, I don't do random hookups, so I guess we're at an impasse. Still using his hands, he breaks off some of my eggs and puts it to my mouth. It's too close. Too intimate, and I want to move my head away, but I open my mouth and take it. To tease him, I suck on his fingertips before letting him go. Yeah, I don't let random women suck on my fingers, regardless of how beautiful they are. It just so happens that I don't want to be in a relationship with you either. I pretend to dramatically exhale and wipe my forehead in relief. Well, then, conversation over. I grab my fork and reach into my plate, but he moves it out of the way to feed me. Right. I mean, why would I want to be tied down to a beautiful, sexy, smart woman like you? You only speak three languages. He leans close and says, do you have any idea how sexy that is? Wherever we go, I'm going to have the smartest woman on my arm. Everyone's going to be so jealous of me. He laughs to himself, and I do everything in my power to suppress my own amusement. We're not going anywhere together. I can do way better than you, I add. When I am ready and willing to commit, that is. He shrugs. Undoubtedly, you can do better, but unfortunately for you, I'm what you're getting about. He takes my hand and wraps both of his around it. He kisses it three times and stops. I look up and lock eyes with his. I want you to come to my games, at least the home games for now. For now? Whoa. What you're suggesting sounds like a relationship? You mean the thing that two adults have when they are into each other? Especially after a night of unbridled passion the likes of which neither one of them had ever experienced before? He puts a hand to his heart. Don't be dramatic. Who says I've never experienced it before? You think highly of yourself. He picks up my hand again and brings it to his lips. The gentle touch of his lips on my skin causes something to stir in the pit of my stomach. Maybe I'm the one who's never had it before. I watch as he eats the rest of my food. I sip my coffee and wait for him to look up at me. His hair is so big and messy, my fingers itch to try and tame it. He's still shirtless, and I take my time admiring his body. His skin is tanned and smooth. He has no blemishes, and unlike some of his teammates, he has no tattoos. What are you doing, Victoria? He clears his throat and I look up to find him staring at me. And not that I'm into you, but what are your reasons for not being into me again? He stands and goes into my fridge. He pulls out a casserole dish containing a half chicken from last night. He sits down and rips the drumstick out and starts to eat. Disgusted, I look away. Many reasons, but we'll add your eating habits to the list. Right. A little bit of a caveman. So, what if I agree to use a knife and fork from now on? And I won't eat your food either. I stare at him, pretending not to understand what he's saying. I arch an eyebrow and wait for him to say more. Nah, I finally say. The way you eat is the least of it. Right. What else? Things you can't fix. I stand and grab a vanilla yogurt from my fridge. I barely take a spoonful before he moves his chair next to me. You gonna share that with me? I sigh, give him the yogurt and grab myself another. So, I'll have Kendall call you. He stands and offers me his hand. I have to go, but I'll see you tomorrow. It's not a question. It's a statement of fact. He doesn't let go of my hand when he starts to walk back to my bedroom. I think we're having two different conversations here. No men with kids. No celebrities. He pulls on his jeans, covering his nicely shaped ass. The t-shirt goes on his body next, and I feel as if our little bubble is about to burst. And what else? No white guys from Alabama, right? 
I look down, either agreeing nor disagreeing with him. I can't help where I'm from, darlin', or my race. And I'm not a celebrity. I'm an athlete who's grateful for every fan. But, yeah, relationships suck. He grabs my wrist, pulls me into his arms, and holds me tight against his body. We won't call it a relationship. Who needs titles? We're just two people who eat together, make love only with each other, and share popcorn while we watch a movie on a Friday night. The fact that you were sprawled on top of me makes no difference. He takes both of my hands in his and brings them to his lips. Colt. Just come to these two home games in a few days. I fly to El Vare tonight. If you can't come to the away games, come to the ones here. Not as my girlfriend or any tang. Girlfriend? Are you crazy? I try to break free of him, but he pulls me closer. He sighs as if I annoy him and says, I said not as my girlfriend. You just don't listen. No one will even know you're there for me. You'll just be a fan. My very own little good luck charm. He kisses my cheeks, my eyelids, and then my mouth. That's it. He lets me go and raises both hands up. If we lose, it will be on your head. I huff and stare at the ceiling. I hate basketball, I tell him while I stomp my feet. Other than it being my career, livelihood, and all I've known since I was a kid, I totally agree with you. Basketball is the worst. Football is where it's at. He looks around the bedroom for his belt. While he puts it on, he says, and I know we're not a couple and we don't need to compromise, but I'll come to one girly thing of your choice. Like a doily making class or something to dot. A what? A doily. Those white thingies. When I give him a blank stare he sighs loudly and says, Mama will explain it better when you two meet. I think you've officially lost your mind. If you really want to punish me, drag me for a deep tissue massage. I'd be really mad about that. He slaps my ass and sits on the bed to pull on his sneakers. Do you belong to a book club? You look like the type of woman who does. As a matter of fact, yes, I tell him. Drag me to one of those. If you really want to punish me, make me read anything by John Grisham. I hate those. He winks and kisses my cheek. I know we're not in a relationship or anything, but if we were, we'd be kicking butt. We got this, darlin' a dot. Am I supposed to come to this game by myself? He looks up and smiles while he ties his shoes. Bring a friend. A female friend, he stresses. Work out the details with Kendall, but I have to go. He bows dramatically, and a piece of his hair falls on his forehead. My queen, my liege. Until we meet again. He kisses me deeply and walks out of the bedroom and out of my apartment. I drop myself on the bed and stare at the ceiling, wondering just what the hell I got myself into. Last night was supposed to be a night of fun and sex, the type of night I promised myself more of. The type of night where I indulge in carnal pleasure without the shackles of commitment, but I don't think Colt Chastain understands what casual sex is. I reach over to my nightstand and grab my phone. There's already a text from Colt. 16. Colt. When I showed up at Victoria's house last night, I had no expectations. No, that's not true. I expected her to slam the door in my face, but she surprised me and invited me in with little resistance. Sleeping with her last night was a wish I thought I'd have to wait longer to fulfill, if ever. I'm not naive enough to believe that what happened last night means we're any closer. In fact, I think she slept with me to get rid of me. I was an itch she wanted to scratch too, and she thought I'd walk away after that, freeing us both from whatever the hell this is. She could not have been more wrong. I lean my head back and close my eyes while Dante pulls up to my building. I hop out when he opens the door for me. I'll see you in a few hours, I tell him. My apartment is eerily quiet when I get home, and I miss my son. 
I miss the mess and the noise. It's been the two of us and the nannies, and the house is extra lonely whenever his grandmother shows up for the weekend, but I believe it's important for him to spend time with her and with his sister. I shower quickly, dress, and pack for the two nights I'll be spending in Los Angeles. My hope is to sweep this series so that I can spend some time with Evan before the final start. Next week is his last week of school, and afterwards, Mama will visit before we all fly back to Alabama. Victoria complicates things, though. Now, I need to figure out a way to get her to Alabama, and somehow, I believe that will be a fight. Maybe our first, but it's a fight I don't intend to lose. I leave the suitcase in front of the door and walk out of the apartment to go a few floors down. I own another unit in this building, and this is where Evan's grandmother stays when she visits. I knock on the door, and Isabel, Evan's grandmother, opens it. She doesn't smile, but she hasn't smiled since her daughter died. Part of her blames me for bringing her here, even though I didn't. She refuses to see that Kelsey's problems with drugs started way before she stepped foot in New York City. She gestures for me to come in. Evan runs to me, and I pick him up. Daddy! You want pancakes? It's after eleven in the morning. He's usually almost ready for lunch now, but she lets him stay up late despite me telling her not to. Hi Colt! Mia, Evan's eight-year-old sister walks over in a long nightgown. She hugs me tight, and I bend down to kiss the top of her head. I've missed you. Me too, Mia. Me too. I put Evan down and follow them into the kitchen. Isabel makes me an omelet, even though I've told her I've already eaten. I eat it while the kids laugh and talk about the movie marathon they had last night. I wish I could go with you, Evan says. Me too, Mia agrees. You can come to one of the away games since you'll be out of school next week. Mia, if your grandma agrees, you both can come too. Isabel huffs and shrugs. She's a big woman, close to six feet with wide shoulders. She was once pretty, but hard living, and the death of her daughter has aged her. You two have fun and listen to your grandma. I have to go. I have practice and I'm flying out this afternoon. I'll see you in a few days. I kiss my son on the cheek, hug him tight, and leave the apartment. Leaving him is always the hardest. It never gets easier. In fact, it gets harder because he needs me more as he gets older. I never set out to be a single father. I never set out to be a father at all. I didn't want the responsibility. I saw my parents struggle with us, and then I watched Mama try to do it all herself. I always wanted my life to be mine until Kelsey got pregnant. She claims it was an accident when it first happened, but during one of our fights, she admitted she did it on purpose. By the time I get in a practice and have a session with one of the massage therapists, I'm ready for the flight west. We leave the stadium on a chartered bus that takes us to Teterboro Airport an airport for private planes just 12 miles outside of Manhattan. I'm hungry and tired by the time we board, and when the smell of food hits my nose, my stomach growls. Move it along. I playfully shove Wachowski, who bumps into Hayden, a seven-foot power forward. He pushes Wachowski off him and he falls into me. We continue shoving him back and forth until he sits down and gives us both the finger. Hayden runs a hand through his messy blonde hair and down his face. I bet Chasty finally got his dick wet. He's been in a good mood all morning. I reach over and slap Wachowski in the back of the head. Watch your mouth, boy. I pull out my phone and frown when I see no missed calls or texts from Vicky. Me, I still don't miss you. Wachowski tries to take my phone from me, but I turn and give him my back. I put the phone in my pocket and say, Grow up, Wachowski. What's this? Jerome Peters, a small forward, asks. He takes the seat facing me. Tasty Chasty got into some pussy? He uses one of the many nicknames the team has given me. No wonder he was smiling today. And I think it was a full moon last night. 
Shut up. I start to say more, but my phone buzzes in my pocket. Ignoring my teammates, I pull it out and smile when I see a text from her. Queen V, you're wasting your time. Me, I'm not. I said I don't miss you. Only people in relationships miss each other. Queen V, good because I don't miss you either. She's black, Wachowski announces. Who's black, someone from the back of the plane asks. Peters, I announce. And Ingalls, and Harris, everyone boos me when I start to name all the black players on the team. Chase this girl, Wachowski says. He gives me a playful grin, and I remind myself the idiot is only 21 years old, but acts 10 years younger. Yeah? Save some for the rest of us. Peters playfully punches me in the arm. Is she cute? Introduce me. I let out a loud bark of laughter. You live with your mama, Peters. You can't even have girls spend the night. Everyone on the plane howls with laughter. She lives with me, asshole. Peters and I probably have the most in common on the team. He's from Tampa and grew up with two brothers and a single mother after his father died when he was 17. He takes care of his family, and his mother is extremely religious. Me, are you going to not miss me until you come to my game in four days? Not that I'm counting. Queen V, I'm not wearing the jersey. I can see her now, wearing my number seven in the gold and magenta jersey. Me, would you rather wear something else of mine? Like my scent. Queen V, you're annoying. Stop texting me. I'm busy. Me, what are you doing? Queen V, what's with all the questions? We are not in a relationship, remember? Me, as if I would ever be with a Yankee. But tell me what you're doing. Queen V, writing. Me, writing what? Queen V, my book, you dumb jock. I send her a brain emoji followed by a smile. Me, my queen is brilliant. I won't brag about you since we're not in a relationship. Queen V, please don't. Me, text something sexy to me in French. Queen V, nope. Me, I won't be thinking of you while I'm gone. Queen V, that would be a waste of your time. Me, and I don't want you thinking of me. Queen V, who is this? And don't tell me what to do. Me, you know who it is, darling. You called my name about a dozen times this morning. She sends a gif of someone doing an eye roll. I shut off my phone in anticipation of takeoff and look up to see my teammates staring at me. Yeah, he definitely got fucked, Gilbert, another teammate shouts. Everyone cheers. Wachowski jumps up from his seat and dives on top of me while everyone catcalls. I manage to push his lanky body away. A gentleman doesn't kiss and tell, I announce to the plane. 17. Vicky. I'm not going, I say to Tara for the millionth time. I have my phone on speaker while I look at my reflection in the mirror. My hair is curly tonight and my makeup is minimal, but my red lipstick sticks out like the hot sun on a desert island. And why is that, she asks. She coughs a few times. Because I don't date athletes. I don't date. At least not at this moment. I'm focusing on these books, Anne. And you're allowed to have a life, sister. I sigh. She's the wrong audience. I should have called my twin. He always agrees with me. I have a life. I have a great life. It's true. Working in the public school system was an eye-opener. This black girl who grew up in Harlem is privileged, pampered, and adored by her entire family. The things that some of my students experience daily only shed light on my privilege. Not only the love of a family but money and wealth. I left college without owing a dollar in student loans. My father gave me an apartment when I was 22. I've traveled the world. There's nothing that I want that's not attainable. At least not anything that money can buy. 
You do, but also need. Don't even say it. I cut her off before she can say the dreaded word. I don't do that. She lets out a loud snort. Yeah, okay. I grab a pair of tweezers and pull out a few stray hairs in my eyebrows and curse myself for not getting them waxed earlier. But I came home right after school, wrote for a solid two hours, and got ready for this. Now it's the middle of the week and I have to go to a basketball game. Which means I probably won't be home until after midnight. But it's the last week of school and there are no assignments to grade this week. I can afford to stay out late a few nights. It's just a game. I'll go tonight and that will be it. God, I hope dad doesn't see me because I'm not ready to answer any of his questions. We'll all be at tomorrow's game. We're bringing dad. Evan's going with us too, so we can all sit together. My heart drops at the mention of Evan and how he reacted when his father paid me a little bit of attention. Um, nope. I'm not going tomorrow. This is a one and done. I don't even like basketball. And we're not a couple. We're just two people who enjoyed a night together. I'm a city girl who has lived with two avid sports fans. Basketball is dad and Alan's favorite sport, but they also watch football, baseball, soccer, and even hockey. You can walk into the Taylor household and find one of them watching a game. When they're together, they're loud, often cheering for the home team or cussing up a storm if they lose. None of that has prepared me for the experience of Madison Square Garden. The entire stadium is full of people dressed in gold and magenta. Chica, Hunter whispers from behind me while I follow the usher to our seats, this is center court. Holy shit, Cody is going to be jealous, but heaven help you if I get hit in the face with a ball. I ignore him and say another prayer that my dad doesn't see me. I know he's watching. We talked about it this morning over coffee, but I didn't mention going to the game. Magenta is my color though, Hunter says. We take our seats. You don't look so bad yourself. Nice boobs. I look down and do a little shake for my friend. After fighting a war with myself, I put on the jersey, along with the matching mischief's cap. I pull it down, hoping it will shield me from any prying eyes. Colt promised he would not acknowledge me. I'm just a fan watching the game. That's it. And even though I didn't want to be here, the excitement of the crowd and the enormity of the stadium has given me unexpected excitement. Will you calm down? I put my hand on Hunter's thigh and wonder if I made the right choice in bringing him. Tamron would bring too much attention, my dad would ask too many questions, and Alan's not here. Tara is coming tomorrow and couldn't make it tonight. So, you and Colt doing the nasty or what? You're going to have to climb him like a tree with your short ass. Someone offers each of us a cup of beer, and I happily accept. Apparently, we get free food and snacks too. And if you're not, start because I can get used to this. He sighs and leans back in his seat. We take selfies with each other, and he posts on his social media. I relax slightly and tell myself that I'm going to enjoy tonight. I might not know how to follow the game, but I'm here with a friend, and I promised him a good time. The Mischiefs won one of the away games, tying the series. If they can win both games while on their home turf, that would mean they only need to win one more game to move on to the championship. The stadium fills up, the lights dim, and they announce the opposing team. Hunter grabs my hand and squeezes when the Mischiefs are announced. When Colt comes out, the entire stadium stands and cheers. He won the last game in the last second by throwing up a three-pointer, giving them the win by one point. Hunter and I stand and cheer. All thoughts of not wanting to be here flee, and I give in to the enthusiasm of the crowd. Colt waves, looks around, and I swear that his eyes lock with mine. He winks, and I wink back. For the next hour, we watch and cheer each time the mischiefs score. The exhilaration of the crowd is not like anything I ever could have imagined, and I ask myself why I've never been to a game before. When we lead by 10 points after the first quarter, Hunter and I hug as if we just won a war. 
we turn around and high-five the people around us. The lead doubles by the end of the second quarter and the stadium goes wild as do Hunter and I. We're in a tight hug, jumping in the aisle, so lost in the excitement that I don't see what's happening until it's too late. The roar of the crowd triples, and the announcer loses his train of thought. Looks like Chastain isn't going into the locker room with the rest of his team like he should. Oh, wait. What's happening here? I look up in time to see him jump over two rows of seats. He gets to me and Hunter before I can register what he's doing. He grabs me by the front of the shirt and plants a hard kiss on my lips. It's over before it even begins. He lets me go, I stumble back, and Hunter catches me. The crowd goes wild, and I see my shocked expression on the jumbotron. My mouth hangs open, and I can feel the heat creeping up my neck as I imagine the hundreds of ways I'm going to torture Colt Chastain until he dies. I sit, stunned, and grab Hunter's hand. I'm going to kill him. The words are barely out of my mouth when I feel my phone vibrating in my purse. There are text messages from everyone I work with, my dad, brother, and sister. There's also one from Jerry. I sigh and shove the phone deep in my purse, unwilling to deal with this now. I pull the lid of my hat down, shielding my face, but Hunter pulls it off, pulls me closer, and whispers, You're definitely doing the nasty. Don't hide, Chica. He just outed you to the world. Be fabulous. 18. Colt. We won with an 8-point lead. LA got their act together by the fourth quarter, but we were too pumped with the roar of the crowd. I was pretty much unstoppable, scoring a total of 40 points. A body crashes into me on the way to the shower. The locker room's energy is infectious. When Wachowski tries to jump on my back, I move out the way, put him in a headlock, and mess his hair. Chasty. Introduce me to your girl. Maybe she can give me a good luck kiss at the next game. I tighten my arm around his neck and toss him aside. Coach Walsh walks over and pats my shoulder in approval. Good job, Chastain. Maybe next time, save the kiss for after the game. He walks away and I walk into the shower. Thirty minutes later, I take a few questions about the game from the press, but after three questions, the reporter turns to my personal life. Since your wife died, we've only seen you date one woman, and that ended over a year ago. Can you tell us what that kiss at halftime was about? Talia, a very determined reporter, waits for my answer. She's someone I've started seeing that. Yes, Victoria Taylor. A public school teacher and daughter of John Taylor, founder of the now-defunct Taylor Toys. Well, that didn't take long. Well, I guess you already have all the answers, Talia. Are you in a relationship with Victoria Taylor? She asks. I wouldn't have kissed her if I wasn't, and that's all I'm willing to say about my private life. I will, however, answer questions about the game. Talia starts to ask a question, but a more abrasive reporter cuts her off and says, How do you think your fans from back home will react to this relationship? Coach Walsh is beside me, and I feel his body tense. Questions about the game. Do you have one? I look around and wait for someone else to raise their hand. You're from a small town outside of Birmingham, he insists. I know where I'm from. You have a question about the game? Then what are you doing with a black woman? All patience I had disappears. I point a finger at him and say, what's your point? and watch your mouth. But he doesn't stop. He stands and starts to speak again, but coach stands and says, he said watch your mouth. Next question. He points to another reporter, a black man sitting in the front. I take several more questions, each related to the game before I step away from the podium and coach takes over with the reporters. I ignore my teammates while I walk to the exit. The adrenaline from the game is yet to die down, but I take a deep breath because I know what's waiting for me on the other side of the door. My car is there, and Vicky is leaning against it with her arms crossed and eyes narrowed. I nod at Dante, 
who mouths good luck before getting inside the car. I hold the door open and gesture for her to get inside. She doesn't. I am so going to kill you, she whispers. She looks around, and when she makes sure no one is paying attention to us, she turns back to me and cracks her knuckles. I'd laugh if the look on her face wasn't so serious. Where's your friend? I ask her, relieved that I don't see him. He took an Uber to his boyfriend's. I sigh, cup her face, and kiss her. She relaxes for a fraction of a second and kisses me back. Right before she bites my lower lip. Mm. Do that again. Like I did at the stadium, I grab her shirt and bring her closer. I like my women feisty, and a little pain turns me on. She pushes me, but I take her hand and put it on the growing bulge in my pants, but she yanks it away as if burned. I told you I didn't want anyone to know. My dad saw that. He's been blowing up my phone for two hours, you thoughtless jerk. I put both hands up and surrender. I'm sorry, darling. I got so excited, and I looked up and saw you wearing my jersey and forgot myself. I take her hand and put it to my chest. I've done it with my mama a million times. I just get so excited when someone I care about comes to my games. She pulls her hand away and swats me several times. Don't compare me to your mama, you mama's boy. I put my hands up to shield myself from her hits and laugh when she only hits me harder. Well, as hard as someone her size can hit. Queen V, come on. I grab her wrists and pull her against my chest. Nothing's changed. We're still not a couple. She doesn't say a word. She stays pressed against me. I let go of one wrist and snake my free arm around her waist, holding her in place. God, I like how her soft body feels against mine. Even as she pants like a cornered animal, all I want to do is bend down and kiss her. I saw your post-game press conference or whatever it's called, she says. She flares her nostrils and her words come out in pants. I drop her other wrist and scratch my head. Press conference? When she twists her mouth in disbelief, I pretend to finally remember. Oh, right. Yeah, I'm contractually obligated to have those. Part of the job. They're always a blur. I never remember a word I said. She shoves me away and I pretend to take a few steps back, but my laugh gives me away. Really? You don't remember a word you said? I shake my head and do my best to look confused. I don't understand what you're mad at. She pulls out her phone and replays my press conference from a few minutes ago. I put a hand to my mouth in shock. Oh. I see why that would make you mad. I point at the offending phone. My goodness, I don't know what got into me. Must be the post-game endorphins. Now do you understand why I don't drink? I just can't be trusted. Thanks to your wandering lips, they know my name. This is what I told you I didn't want. You did the exact opposite of what we talked about the other night. Darlin', that definitely shouldn't have happened, I explain quickly. But look at it from my side. Cameras and the adrenaline from the game. And that Yankee reporter was talking so darn fast, I could barely understand what she was saying. Dot. I make sure my southern twang gets thicker with each word. I have no memory of uttering those words, but I'll fix it at the next press conference. I'll tell them we're not Datton, and that I don't think about you when I'm away. I won't tell them how much I'm looking forward to the off-season so we can spend time together. Or how I want to take you to Alabama so you can meet my old high school coach. And forget about meeting Mama. Those are things that couples do, and we're not a couple. What else do you want me to tell them? I scratch my head and appear deep in thought. Do you want me to tell them that we can't possibly be a couple because of your rules? What were they again? I've been hit in the head by so many basketballs, my memory ain't what it should be. I'll write it down next time, I promise. Will you shut up, Chastain? She hisses. So, I guess Mama raised a liar. 
I give her a blank stare. You know what, just stop talking. I gesture locking my lips and throwing away the key. This is not what we talked about, and I don't appreciate being set up. Goodbye, jerk. I take a step closer, but she puts a finger to my face and says, I'm done with you. I'll tell the press that you would never consider being with me because I have a kid. Or because I'm from Alabama. How about how you don't date white men? You tell me what you want me to say, and I'll say it. She stares at me, eyes wide and mouth hanging open. She jerks her head back. It's like she's trying to decide what to make of me. I reach for her hand, but she moves it away. I catch it and bring it to my lips. You're an asshole. This time the laugh I was trying to hold and slips out. I don't want to be with you because you're a manipulative, thoughtless jerk. Don't say a word about me to anyone ever again. You've done enough damage. I turn her hand over and kiss the middle of her palm. Her nostrils flare and she tries to muffle her groan with a sigh. But hear me out. She snatches her hand from me, moves away, and crosses her arms. I don't want to hear another word from you. I put a finger under her chin, but she wraps her hand around it and twists it. It doesn't hurt, even though I think that's her intention. I give her what she wants and let out an exaggerated pained yelp. She tries to bend it back, but I press against her palm. Let's see how well you play with a broken finger, you liar. I pull my hand away and hold both hands up and surrender. You set me up. Did I? I reach for her hand again and quickly intertwine my fingers with hers. I asked you to come to my game and wear my jersey, and you did. You let my driver pick you up, and you waited for me after the game. That's so I could tell you off for being a lying jerk to your face. We said we weren't dating. She whispers the last word as if it's a sordid secret. She walks away, and I wonder if she knows where she's going. We're in the back of the stadium. It's just after midnight and dark outside. I count to ten, mainly to get my laughter under control. Dante, come and find us in ten minutes. You got it, boss. I wasn't prepared for how fast Vicky walks. By the time I catch up with her, we're on an isolated and dark street behind the stadium. I try to get a firm grip on her elbow, but she yanks it away and starts to run. I look to the heavens for patience before I start chasing her. It doesn't take long. She's turned a corner, taking us out of the desolate stretch of street, and she bumps into a burly man. A second man approaches, and the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There's more light at this corner, but we're alone. Let me go, I hear her say, but the man is holding on tight. You ran into me, sweetheart, he says, and from the slur of his speech, I know he's drunk. He's not very tall, a couple of inches under six feet, but he's wide and husky. His friend is built the same way. He tightens his arm around her. Good thing you did too because you feel good. He turns to his companion and says, I'm gonna have her first, then you can have her. Vicky lets out a string of expletives and tries to get out of his hold but can't. Hands off, I say as I approach. She's with me. Get your fucking hands off me you piece of shit, Vicky says. You can have a go after my brother, the guy says. Get in line. He starts to chuckle and looks at his brother. That's when my fist connects with his jaw. He lets go of Vicky and I push her behind me. Get out of here, I yell at her. The two guys come after me. It's not much of a fight. I punch the first one in the stomach, and he doubles over. When the brother approaches, I elbow him in the nose, and blood gushes out. They both try to come at me at once, but I trip one and punch the other in the face hard, knocking him out. Your hand. Vicky says from behind me. I told you to go. I yell but she approaches. The guy that fell on his face starts to stir. He turns on his back, and that's the biggest mistake he's made tonight. Vicky kicks him hard in the balls, and he lets out a noise like an animal who's just been shot. 
She kicks him again and says, think of this the next time you want to force yourself on a woman. She jumps on top of him and stomps him a few times. Then, she approaches the other and starts to kick him. I see a set of headlights. Dante parks the car and jumps out. He quickly assesses the situation and pulls out the gun he keeps holstered to his side. Dante carries a gun? Vicky asks. She runs behind me as if the gun is the scariest thing to happen to her tonight. Go, boss. I'll handle this. He pulls out his phone and texts something. I'll call you once it's handled. I lift Vicky off her feet, physically put her in the back seat of the car, and slam the door. I get in the driver's side and pull away from the curb. Why didn't you tell me that Dante carries a gun? I should have known I was around a firearm. I don't answer. I grew up with firearms. Daddy taught me and Charlie to shoot at an early age. We knew about gun safety by the time we went to kindergarten, but people in this city believe guns are dangerous. Is he going to kill them? I look in the rearview mirror. She's craning her neck to look behind her. Of course not. He used to be a cop. He's going to take care of them, but everything will be by the book. She sits back, closes her eyes, and exhales. She puts a hand to her chest and spends the entire drive to her house with her eyes closed. It takes a couple of minutes to find a parking space. I'm not sure where I park is legal, but I don't care about any of that right now. They can tow the damn thing away. I step out and open Vicky's door for her, offer her my hand, and she takes it without a fight. She's still breathing hard by the time we step inside her apartment. She throws her purse on the couch and goes right for the freezer to pull out an ice pack. I wince when she puts it to my chin. I don't remember getting hit on the chin, but now I can feel a stinging sensation there and above my right eye. I'm so sorry, she says. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have walked off like that. I can't even imagine what would have happened if you didn't follow me. I press a finger to her lips, lift her off her feet, and walk us to the couch. You have nothing to apologize for. It's not your fault. Promise you won't walk off alone again at night. I expect her to fight me, but she surprises me. I won't. I cup her face and look into her eyes. She's still breathing erratically, and her eyes are unfocused. Are you okay? She nods. I'm fine. What about you? What about your hands? How are you supposed to play if you break a bone? She grabs both my hands and turns them over. I have a couple of cuts on my knuckles, but nothing more. I flex my fingers and wave my hands around. They're fine. I've done worse in fights with my brother when we were teens. I know how to throw a punch. Don't worry about me. I caress her cheek and she audibly exhales. She jumps off my lap and returns with a first aid kit. She cleans my cuts with an alcohol swap and wraps them in a bandage. She cleans my face afterward. Once she's determined I'm okay, she rests her forehead on mine. Thank you for saving me, Colt. Thank you for being there when I needed you. I kiss her cheek. You don't have to thank me. I was exactly where I wanted to be. I'm exactly where I want to be now. She leans into me and cradles my face. I admit, Queen V, as much as I love having your sexy little body pressed on top of mine, I miss my little firecracker. Since we're both okay, why don't we finish the fight we were having before you took off? She cups my jaw and plants kisses all over my face then rests her forehead on mine again and says, You're a big fat liar, and I want you out of my life. Then she bites my chin, making me jolt in surprise. See yourself out. She jumps off my lap and points to the door, but I take her wrist and pull her back to me. I wrap my arms around her, securing her in place. You've told me, Queen V. Can I tell you something now? The adrenaline from earlier starts to evaporate, and all I want is my Vicky back. 
the spitfire who wants nothing to do with romantic relationships. She turns her gaze on me again and says, Will it be the truth? The absolute truth. I grasp her chin and turn her head so she can look at me. I want you. She opens her mouth to speak, but I put my finger to her lips. Not only in bed, and if you're honest with yourself, you'll admit that you want me too. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in my arms right now. I want you at all my games, in my jersey, and I want the world to know you're there for me. I put my nose on her shoulder and plant a soft kiss. You want to know my wildest fantasy? I lift my head and look into her eyes. What is it? Her voice is low, and the fear and anger from earlier is gone, replaced with mild curiosity. The other night when you made me snacks and cuddled with me on the couch? She stares and waits for me to say more, but I remain quiet. What about it, Chastain? I don't have all night, she snaps. It was everything. Believe it or not, I've never had anyone other than Mama, she sighs at the mention of my mother, do that for me. She snorts and looks away. Liar. I'm sure your wife did that for you. And if that's your fantasy, you're boring. I don't do boring. I take her chin and turn her toward me. She didn't, and one day I'll tell you all about that, but not tonight. Tonight, I want to be home with you. I want to eat dinner with you, go to bed with you, and wake up with you. I just want to be boring with you. I cradle the back of her neck and kiss her forehead. Her body finally relaxes into mine. I'm going to climb this wall that you've got around yourself. I kiss her forehead and rest mine against it. You better take your butt home to your son, she mutters, and I let out a loud laugh. You're perfect, do you know that? Absolutely perfect, and anyone who doesn't see that is blind. He's spending the night with his good friend Vincent. I talked with them both after the game. Is that okay with you? I kiss her lips, and as much as I want to deepen it, I don't. The next move is up to her. She stares at me, and I pick up her hand. I suppose you're hungry? I exhale in relief and say, famished. Don't get used to me cooking for you. I'm not the type of woman who serves a man. I'll only require it after every home game. Have I told you that women who don't serve men are my favorite type? She hops off my lap and starts to rummage through her fridge. I admire her backside. She has my jersey tied at her waist and has her hair in a high ponytail, leaving her long neck exposed. She slams the fridge shut and approaches. I brace myself for what she's going to say next. You get one chance. She holds up her index finger. And I don't know what this is. She gestures between us. But I'm not labeling it. I nod in agreement, but she narrows her eyes at me and says, I mean it. No labels. I hear what you're saying, Queen V. She rolls her eyes at the nickname. But the thing is, I like labels. I'm a forward. I'm Evan's dad. I'm Mary Lee's son. Another I roll. Labels help keep me organized, so as much as I don't want to, I'm going to embrace the label of Victoria Taylor's boyfriend. Her eyes nearly bug out of her head at that announcement. She shakes her head, and I nod yes. Boyfriend? Are you out of your goddamn mind? You overstep. I stand and wrap my arms around her. I can see how one might come to that conclusion about me, but since I let it slip at the press conference, we're kind of stuck. She crosses her arms. Oh, really? We're stuck now. You said you'd take care of it at the next press conference. I did, but I thought about it. I scratch my head and make a face like I just tasted something bitter. Just think of the hit my reputation would take if we're not seen together. She sighs and walks away from me. The world will think I'm some sort of philanderer and Mama would get mad. Not to mention. She puts a hand up, signaling for me to shut up. I swear, if you mention your Mama one more time, I'm going to hit you. Just shut up. 
do you need to shower? She opens the fridge and pulls out three Tupperware containers. And I assume you're ready to eat now. More than ready. I surprise her when I wrap my arms around her from behind and kiss the side of her neck. I meant what I said. One chance. That's all I need. Screw it up, and that's it. My queen, my leech. I swear my fealty to you. I let her go so I can bow. She sighs and tells me to sit down. Does that mean I have myself a girlfriend? She returns to the fridge and starts to rummage through it. I'm not labeling it, but you call it whatever you want. It's your own fault, you know. She slams the fridge shut and says, What is? You. I point at her. With that face and those sexy legs. Remember the night we met? I couldn't stop looking at you, and then you try to dress me down about my son. I'm a single father. That's like feeding a stray cat and expecting it to stay away. I was a goner within ten minutes of meeting you. You sealed your own fate. 19. Vicky. He's so smug, my hand aches to connect with his cheek, but he's so sexy sitting at my kitchen table. Despite the redness and bruising on his chin and eye, he's still the most handsome man I've ever been with. He's so tall, he sits sideways, because his knees won't fit under the table. I put fresh fruit, cheese, and a few crackers on a plate and put it in front of him. He snatches my wrist and yanks me onto his lap. Thanks, Queen V, he says right before he presses his lips to my cheek. I giggle at the nickname and relax in his lap. He feels good. Hard but comfortable, and when he wraps those arms around me, I want to stay in his embrace all night. You're welcome, jerk. The microwave pings, and I start to climb off his lap, but he tightens his hold. You smell good. He sticks his face in the crook of my neck and kisses my skin. You feel even better. I already like being your boy. If you know what's good for you, you won't finish that sentence. He lifts his head and gives me the same mischievous smile from earlier. A piece of his curly hair falls onto his forehead, and I swipe it out of the way. What can you do to me? I make a fist at him, and he covers it with his large palm. He closes his hand around mine and squeezes it when I try to pull it away. If I want to say that I like being your boyfriend, I'm going to say it. He kisses my temple. And you are going to like being my girlfriend. I look at him, give him my best stern look and shake my head. Yeah, you will. I don't think you've ever been spoiled by a man, have you? I throw my head back and let out a big belly laugh. Spoiled by a man? There's nothing a man can buy me that I can't buy myself. I don't need to be spoiled. He puts his forehead on my shoulder, and I rest my chin on his head. He tightens his hold around my waist, and I relax fully into him. I'm not talking about buying you things, which I will do. I'm talking about calling you to make sure you're okay. Bringing you coffee in bed. Loving on you when you're sick. Cheering your victories, and fixing your mistakes. Someone who just accepts you, warts and all. And I know I'm away a lot with my job, but even when I'm away, I'm going to be thinking about you and talking care of you. All you have to do is let me. He peppers my temple with kisses, and for an instant, I close my eyes and imagine what that would look like. I've kept myself closed off, even in relationships. There's a part of me that I don't let anyone have, and with Colt's long arms wrapped around me, I imagine what it would be like to let him be that man. I thought it would be Jerry, but when it came time for me to fully commit, I couldn't do it. I told myself it was because I didn't want to leave New York or my family, but the truth was, I didn't think Jerry was worth it. There hasn't been anyone serious since him. I made sure of it. I wasn't looking for anything when I met Colt, but my stepmother says lightning strikes when you least expect it. That's how she met my dad. She backed into his new car in a parking lot and she was bracing herself for a verbal beatdown, but she fell in love instead. Tonight, when he ran to protect me without a second thought for himself, it thawed something in me. 
He was so feral, so protective. He pushed me aside and told me to run, as if I would ever leave him to deal with those thugs alone. But the way he protected me is not something I will ever forget. Nor will I forget what he looked like taking those two guys on by himself. Will you let me be that person for you? When I don't respond, he grasps my chin and holds my stare. Will you let me in? It will be good, I promise. I've never had it either, he says. Never had what? A lover who's also a friend. Someone who will take care of me like you're doing now. I'll be the happiest man on earth if all you do is eat with me after a game. I run a hand through his curly hair. You're easy to please, then. You should demand much more than that. He stares up at me while I caress his scalp. You're selling yourself short, champion. You're right. Tell me you're mine. Tell me you'll let me in. Tell me. Jesus, are you always this damn dramatic? Okay, fine. Yes, but you better not, the words are cut off when he kisses me. It's a gentle but deep and possessive kiss. I kiss him back, savoring the taste and feel of his tongue on mine. Colt, I say when we finally break the kiss. I rest my forehead on his and relish in the feel of his hands caressing my back. Yes, Queen V. Why haven't you had those things before in a relationship? You had a wife. I think back to my dad and stepmother. They're not one for overt displays, but they hold hands when watching television. He puts an arm around her whenever they go out. Dad held mother's hand too when they were married. I can't imagine the cold marriage that Colt has hinted at. He runs his hands up and down my back, paying special attention to my lower back, right above my buttocks. It wasn't a good marriage. I'll tell you about it one day, but not now. Tonight, I want to have dinner with my girlfriend. I nod and kiss him one more time before getting up from his lap. I'm still full from the snacks and drinks I had at the game, so I only prepare a plate for him. I slice the chicken and add the mixed veggies and a few potatoes. He thanks me when I put it in front of him, and he pulls me back onto his lap. He offers me a piece of chicken, and the gesture is so unexpected that I accept. He kisses the back of my neck, and a shiver runs down my spine. Are we Sharon? I think I like us using one plate. He offers me another bite but I shake my head. No, I'm full from all the food at the game. Good. I like knowing that I took care of you, just like you're taking care of me right now. He eats, but he pulls me fully into his chest. For the first time in a long time, I relax against a man. You want some water? I ask him a few minutes later. Thanks, darling. I'd love some. He releases his arm from around me, and I go to the fridge. Don't call me darling, I warn him. There's my girl, he says with a smirk. You're right, he says right before he shoves a fork full of food into his mouth. This is delicious, by the way, dumplin a dot. I miss a step on the way back to the table. He reaches out with one of his long arms and takes the bottle of water from me. Dumplin' is worse than darlin', I tell him. He grabs my wrist and pulls me back to his lap. I rest my head in the center of his chest. That's what daddy would call mama. He lets out a loud chuckle. He'd say, honey dumplin', we gotta go. You're already the prettiest girl in all of Alabama. Mama was always late for everything. Still is. He dropped his voice a few octaves when he quoted his father. Don't you ever call me Honey Dumplin', I warn. I won't. You're my darlin', not my dumplin'. Dot. I turn in his arms and lock eyes with him. His eyes are so brown, they're almost black. You always figure out a way to get what you want, don't you? I ask him. He gives me that playful grin. Always, darlin' a dot. He exaggerates the last word. Remember what I told you. You have one chance. That's all I need. I caress his chin. 
It's already turned red and imagine it will turn an ugly shade of blue by tomorrow. I leave him only to return with the ice pack. He hisses when I put it to his chin, wraps a hand around my wrist, and pulls the ice pack off. Do you know what I need right this second, he asks. He pushes his now empty plate aside. I imagine him throwing me on the table and having his way with me. What do you need? I can hear the huskiness in my own voice. It's wet, but warm. It's sweet like molasses. I want this, darling. Thought. He cups my pussy over my jeans. I'm ready for dessert. Put this on my face. Without another word, he stands with me still in his arms and carries me to the bedroom. Once I have my jeans and jersey removed, he pulls down my black silk panties. My bra goes next. He cups my breasts before he bends his head to kiss them. I let out a loud shriek when he picks me up and throws me on the bed. He jumps in right after me, gets on his back, and pulls me on top of him. His hand finds its way between my legs, spreading my pussy apart before sticking two fingers in. Hot and wet, he says against the side of my neck. He slowly takes his fingers out and puts them in his mouth. And sweet. More, queen. Put it on your man's face. So, I do as my man asks. He holds my hips, and I hover above his face while he feasts on me. His tongue is magic. He teases my clit and my entrance. One of his hands finds its way between my ass cheeks. I tense, but he slaps my ass and says, relax, baby. It's okay. His tongue hits my clit right before he takes it between his teeth. Oh, Colt, I moan as I come on his face. He flips us over, and I'm suddenly on my back with him on top of me. He traces his tongue on my neck and licks down to my breast. He takes that same stiff nipple into his mouth and sucks on it hard. My hand finds its way into his hair, and I sigh at the hotness of his mouth on my skin. It's been too long since I've enjoyed being with a man as much as I enjoy being with Colt. And it's too soon to admit this to him, but it's so much more than physical. I like being here with you. In your bed with your feminine sheets that smell like roses. And your soft, little body. I want to touch you all night. He runs his hand down my sides and cups one but cheek. I lick my lips and wait for him to kiss me. He doesn't. He gives me that boyish smile. The one that's crooked despite his perfect features. I reach up and touch his straight nose, trace my finger down his cheek and across his full bottom lip. Kiss your man, darling Nadot. He holds his lips away from mine. He's so close, I smell myself on his breath, but he won't get close enough to kiss me. He holds my stare and waits. I know what he wants. By making the move to kiss him, I'd be confirming what we talked about in the kitchen. But when I feel how hard and strong he is on top of me. When I inhale his scent and feel his warm hand on my skin, I realize that I want this man. Even if it's not forever, I want this. I move just a fraction and graze my lips against his. That's all it takes. He deepens the kiss and I know, in this moment, Colt Chastain has claimed me as his. His kiss is bruising, and he suddenly ends it and kisses his way down my body. Each kiss is like its own fire set on my skin. I twist and writhe underneath him. My pussy is so wet, so ready for him to slide inside. You taste good. Just like I knew you would. He slides a finger inside of me, and I almost combust. Your drip pin a dot. He adds another finger, pushing all the way inside of me. I can't wait to get in this. He pulls out, leaving me empty and wanting more. He reaches over me and grabs one of the condoms he left on my lamp table. He sheaths and positions himself between my legs, then slides inside of me slowly, filling me inch by inch. He grabs my hips and gives one last thrust, filling me completely. Colt, I moan. He pumps into me, filling me to the hilt and pulling out, driving me crazy with need. Sweat coats my back and drips between my breasts. 
He licks between the valley of my breasts while he squeezes one in his large palm. Suddenly, he flips us over and I'm on top of him. All without breaking the connection between us. I plant both hands on his chest for balance and start to grind. Two large hands cut my ass, guiding me as I ride him. He thrusts deep inside of me, catching me off guard. The orgasm takes me by surprise, ripping through me as I shudder on top of him, calling out his name. He's not far behind. I feel him pulsating inside of me. He grunts, and the sound of my name comes out muffled against my neck. His head falls back and bounces on the pillow. With him still inside of me, I put my head on his chest while I catch my breath. He slides out of me and pulls off the condom. After he disposes it, he slides back in the bed, and I cuddle to his side. That was amazing. Thanks for tonight. Thanks for coming to my game, for not killing to me after the press conference, for sticking around to fight those guys with me even though I told you to go, and for talking to care of me tonight. His fingertips glide down my spine and goosebumps overtake me. I have to make this count. I'm flying to L that A right after tomorrow night's game. What's going to happen with Evan while you're gone? He's staying with the nanny. Once the season is over, we go to Alabama and stay there a good chunk of the summer. Satisfied with his answer, I relax and resume my massage. Sounds nice, I say, unsure of how else to respond. It's always good to go home again. Not that I've ever lived or would ever live anywhere other than New York City. As far as I'm concerned, it's the center of the universe and no place else on earth compares. Will you come to LA? I can't. The last day of school is Friday, and I need to be there. Okay, but if we go to the seventh game, I want you to come. I want you there when we win. And I want you at all the games for the finals. Promise me. I promise. He smiles and tightens his hold around me. See, darling? We're already kicking butt in this relationship. Give your man another kiss before we go to sleep. When I don't make a move, he tickles my ribs, practically jolting me out of the bed. When I try to get away, he pulls me on top of him and covers my mouth with his. 20. Vicky. The last few days of school usually have me dressing casually. The kids are ready for their break, and so am I. While I look through my closet for a pair of jeans and a shirt, Colt walks into the bedroom with nothing but a towel wrapped around his waist. His phone is to his ear, and I listen while he talks to his son. You be in good? He winks at me and blows me a kiss. He puts the phone on speaker and tosses it on the bed. Evan's childlike voice fills the room. The cook is making us chocolate chip pancakes. Colt whistles. You never let me have chocolate for breakfast, Daddy. Maybe I should have them bring you back. I don't want you getting used to being a spoiled. I close the closet to give them privacy while I dress, but seconds later, just as I have my jeans pulled up, he barges in and wraps his arms around me, pulling me into his chest. Good morning, darling, he whispers in my ear. I want nothing more than a repeat of last night. I can have you for breakfast. Me too, but that's not a possibility since he's traveling tonight. It's been a couple of years since I've spent the night wrapped in a man's arms. I had forgotten the feeling of safety and comfort from sharing the human touch. I reach behind me and slide my hands into his hair. You're getting me wet. He spins me around to face him, and I tug his hair and slide my hands down his face. They're not too bad, I say about his bruises. He has a red splotch on his chin and a small cut above his eye. Hopefully they won't become discolored. How are your hands? I grab them and flip them over. Other than a few minor cuts across his knuckles, he's fine. I'm fine, but I do like you fussing over me. He sticks his hand in my pants and slides a finger inside of me. And I like getting you wet. I let out a moan and bite my bottom lip. As quickly as it appeared, his finger is gone, but I don't miss the smug grin on his lips. 
A few minutes later, I step out of the closet. I stand in front of the long mirror as I adjust my clothes and wrap a long faux pearl necklace around my neck. I wrap it three times, making three rows with it. I turn around to find him sitting on the bed staring at me. My phone vibrates on the bed next to him, and mother flashes across the screen. I pick it up and hit ignore. I'll make you coffee to go, but I can't join you. I usually stop off at home and have coffee with my dad and the evil one before work. I put on a pair of ballet flats, and after running a brush through my hair, I gesture for him to follow me. He turns down the coffee but offers to drive me to my parents. His driver is outside, holding the door open for us, and he gives us a curt nod before driving us to my parents. Thanks, champion, I say to him once Dante pulls up to the house. He opens the door for us, and Colt escorts me out. I'll see you tonight. Open the door, darlin. I want to say good morning to your family, and one day soon, you're going to tell me what issues you have with your mama. I want to tell him that's not likely to happen, but my dad swings the front door open. What kind of a man would I be if I didn't greet your parents? Colt. Come in. Colt gestures for me to go ahead of him, and he follows me inside. Stay for breakfast, my dad tells him. Vic, set the table. Good to see you too, dad. He comes back, kisses my cheek, and turns back to Colt. So, what's this? Dad gestures between me and Colt. And how come you took Hunter to the game and not your old man? He pulls Colt into the kitchen and pours him a mug of coffee while Cheryl makes breakfast. Dad, Colt has practice. You can visit for a few minutes, can't you Colt? Dad adds more coffee to Colt's mug. Nothing would delight me more, JT. In fact, I want to talk to you. The seriousness of Colt's tone puts me on alert. I turn around and narrow my eyes at him. You too, Mrs. Taylor. Just call me Cheryl. The evil one is practically blushing at Colt. Well, JT, Cheryl, I'd like your permission to court your daughter. The plate I'm holding slips from my hand and lands on the table, and my mouth flies open. Thankfully, the plate does not break. Excuse me? I take a threatening step toward Colt. He takes an exaggerated step back. Sir, ma'am, I care about Victoria very much, and I want to make sure it's okay, with you both, that your daughter and I. This is about to be the shortest rella, I catch myself before I can complete the word. His eyes light up and he smirks. Say it, he whispers. I clear my throat and say, whatever this is, Colton, is about to be over if you don't shut up right now. Cheryl clears her throat, but I know it's to mask her laugh. Dad puts his mug to his mouth to cover his smile. Now, Dumplin', calm down. I'm here to get your mama and daddy's blessing. He turns away from me and looks at my dad. Now full disclosure, she's already agreed, but I want to make sure it's okay, with you. He snakes an arm around my waist, and I fight with all my might to get away, to no avail. We accept, Cheryl says. I look at her with my mouth hanging open. Yes, calm down, Dumplin', my dad says. Welcome to the family, Colt. I elbow him in the ribs. He winces and pretends to be hurt. It's over, I tell him, but he lifts me off my feet and stares into my eyes, doing nothing to hide his amusement before spinning me around the kitchen. Kiss your man, darlin', he says so that only I can hear. Do it. I'll have no problems holding you like this until you do. He squeezes my waist, and I pretend to give in. I lean down and bite his upper lip. I told you I like a little bit of pain. He plants a loud kiss on my lips and puts me down. Now that that's settled, Dad says. Where is Evan? You're both welcome here any time. Colt grins smugly, and I mouth whatever. He discreetly makes an indecent gesture with his tongue. Breakfast is great, with Dad monopolizing Colt while I talk about plans for the last few days of school. 
Cheryl teaches at another high school and plans on retiring in a couple of years. Once breakfast is over, I start to clear the table, but to my surprise, Colt jumps in to help. Sit. You're our guest. He leans in and rubs his nose against my cheek. I'm part of the family now. You heard your daddy. He bites my face, and I let out a yelp of surprise. That's for bit into my lip earlier. He removes the dishes from my hands and takes them to the kitchen sink where he rinses everything before putting it all in the dishwasher. Once we're done, Dad drives Cheryl to work, and Colt insists on driving me to school. Just like he did when we arrived at my house, I turn to him before he can open the door. I'll see you tonight. You will not distract these kids today. He takes my hand in his and intertwines our fingers. What kind of man doesn't walk a lady inside? Especially when the lady in question is his. His lady? When did that happen? I tease. And I swear, I don't know what century you're from. Last night when I told you to kiss your man, and you kissed me. Face it, Queen V, you have yourself a boyfriend. He wraps an arm around me and pulls me close. You're in a relationship. Labels, darlin. We're labeling everything a dot. He gives me his playful grin, and that dimple makes an appearance. Even your daddy approves of me, and you said you were given me one chance. He puts a fingertip underneath my chin and kisses my lips. Let me walk you to class. The driver opens the door, and when we step outside, Colt intertwines his fingers with mine. We would have done this if we went to the same high school. I let out a soft chuckle. There are several people in the hallway, all staring and probably biding their time to approach. I don't think so, Chastain. I was not the type of girl who held hands in high school. I was president of the science club. I worked on the school newspaper, and I worked on the yearbook committee. And I wouldn't give a jock like you the time of day. And you probably wouldn't have noticed me anyway. Wrong. I would have noticed you. He cups my cheeks. Have you seen you? Those perfect lips. He kisses me. This short little body that somehow fits perfectly into mine. Those legs, and that smile. I do everything I can to suppress my smile, but I can't. It spreads across my face. I swear my heart skips a beat every time you smile. I would have come after you, and if you had a boyfriend, I would have beaten him up. I stop abruptly and stare in this face. Ah, my lady likes that. You want me to go beat up the principal? What about the gym teacher? He makes a fist with his free hand. I shake my head and continue our walk inside, but Colt won't stop talking. The result would have been the same as it is now. You would have been mine. We approach my room, and he opens the door for me and gestures for me to go ahead of him. I wonder how long this gentleman act will last, but for now, I'll admit to myself that it's not so bad. We barely have time to close the door before it bursts open and about ten teachers and staff walk in. They circle around Colt like they're a pack of lions on a lonely antelope, but Colt doesn't flinch. He's in his element. I lean against the wall and watch him interact with everyone. He even takes the phone from a teacher who has her husband on FaceTime. I sigh and turn to my whiteboard. It's ostentatious. I squat down and use all my strength to lift the elaborate bouquet of flowers. It must weigh at least 15 pounds. I pluck out the card once I put it on my kitchen island. I return to the door and bring in another box. Queen V. I don't miss you. I'm not thinking about you. I'm definitely not counting the hours until I can see you again. And I won't be looking for you in the crowd. And because I know you'd hate it, I won't have any caveman thoughts about you sitting in the stadium for hours on end watching a sport you hate because your man is playing. And I absolutely don't want you to wear what I left for you in your top dresser drawer. By the way, I need to revisit that drawer soon. Your champion. 
I turn to the other box, which is not quite as heavy as the flowers. This one is cold, and it takes me about five minutes to get it open. It's a tray of twenty chocolate-covered strawberries. Queen V. I hope you enjoy these. Okay, I admit it. I was thinking of you. I got these in a moment of weakness, but I like imagining you in bed eating these while thinking of me. I'll stop thinking about you now. Done. I'm no longer thinking about you. You're champion. I'm not the type of girl who swoons. I'm not the type of girl who falls hard for a man. I'm not the girl who believes in happily ever after. People come into your life and they walk out of it. And it hurts the most when it's the people you love. The ones you least expect to leave. I'm the pragmatic girl. The one who keeps men at a distance. The one who sets the terms in the relationships. I'm the one who walks away, but when I do, I don't leave collateral damage. I drop the card and run to my bedroom. When I open the top drawer, on top of my underwear is a folded jersey. The colors are the same, but this one has more gold than magenta. I lay it on my bed, and without thinking I grab my phone and call him. He picks up on the third ring. My queen, my liege. His voice is low and husky. Did I wake you up? I ask, horrified. I'm sorry. I should have realized you'd be resting before you're. You didn't wake me, darlin, but I'm glad you called. I don't miss you. I don't wish you were here with me. I don't miss you or want to be with you either. You snore. But I do want to thank you for the flowers, the strawberries, and the jersey. You're beautiful and well-mannered. I bite my bottom lip. Tara is the pretty one out of the two of us, but it feels good to hear it about me from Colt. Good manners aren't just for southern gentlemen. Even Yankee parents try to instill them in their children. There's nothing gentlemanly about the things I want to do to you right now, Queen V. Or the things I want you to do to me. I want your juices on my tongue, baby. I want to eat you until you come on my face. I drop myself on my bed and decide to play along. Really? Well, there are a few things I want to do with you. More like I want to do them to you. One thing specifically. If it's what I'm thinking, I just might skip tonight's game. I won't let you do that, but just know that when I do get you alone again, you're going to explode. In your mouth, darlin. I want to explode with those perfect lips wrapped around me. What are you wearing? His accent has thickened. Take your clothes off. I undo the button to my jeans and pull down the zipper when I hear a door open and close. Daddy, a little voice says, you're awake. I was watching the time and waiting. I zip my pants back up, realizing that we've gone as far as we will right now. Yeah, I'm up, buddy. Come here. I'll see you tonight, I whisper. Hold on, Evan. I hear some muffled sounds, and then he says to me, I'm sending a car for you. Same as yesterday. Who's that? Is that Mr. Bradford? Evan asks. I hold my breath and wait to hear what he says to Evan. No. Do you remember Ms. Vicky? She's Ms. Tara's sister. He stays quiet for a while until I hear, oh, yeah, I like Ms. Tara better. Can you call her instead? I don't hear anything else for almost a full minute. Sorry, Dumplin', he croons into the phone. My heart's still in my throat at the rejection, but I remind myself that Evan is a five-year-old little boy who's already lost his mother. He doesn't want to have to compete for his father's attention too. Who is Dumplin'? I do an exaggerated southern accent. Oh, sorry. We agreed I'd call you Darlin. Not Dumplin. I told you my memory is bad. We agreed on no such thing. You're full of it, champion. You're champion. You belong to the people of New York. I belong to you. My breath hitches in my throat, and I shake my head. 
But darlin', as much as I don't want to, I have to get off the phone and get ready for tonight. Evan's waiting for me so we can have dinner, and Go. You don't ever need to explain yourself when it comes to your child. He should come first. Always. The excitement of the game is the same as the night before. The difference is I have more company tonight. Since the boys are out of school, Tara and Ethan have brought Evan and Vincent to the game. Colt also sent tickets for my dad and stepmom, and we're all sitting center court, wearing matching jerseys, drinking beer, and eating the snacks that keep getting delivered. Colt scores 25 points in the first half, and when he hits a three-point shot right as the buzzer rings, the entire place goes wild. The boys high-five each other and everyone around us. Just like he did the night before, Colt jumps through the crowd, kisses me then picks up the boys and tosses them in the air one by one. I can feel the color on my cheeks, and Tara bumps her shoulder with mine. What? I mouth. We'll talk later. More food arrives and she turns to the kids. Evan's smile drops when he looks at me. I smile, but he looks away. I let out a breath, defeated once again by a five-year-old boy who views me as competition. You boys want something to drink? I ask. Soda. Vincent yells. No soda, Ethan says. It's a special occasion, I tell Ethan. Yeah, Daddy. Please. Loosen up, Ethan. We're here to have fun. Tara flags down our server, and the boys tell them what they want. I give Vincent a fist bump, but when I offer one to Evan, he ignores me. Tara notices, and I shrug. We'll be back, she announces and gestures for me to follow her. As soon as she stands, Ethan pulls her into his lap and plants a kiss on her. I follow her to a private bathroom I had no idea existed. The kid hates me, I say as soon as we're alone. Evan? He's a sweetheart. Since when does he hate you? Since he figured out his father was interested in me as more than a friend. I tell her what happened the first time they came to the house, and how he said he likes Tara more than me. But he's five and has lost his mother. His father is gone a lot for work. I don't blame him for not wanting to share him. Remember how we were with dad? He'll come around and see how amazing you are. Give him some time. So, the evil one called me and told me you and Colt are a couple. I shrug and say, can anyone keep their mouths shut in this family? I'm not putting a label on it. You're at a basketball game two days in a row and wearing his jersey. Don't shrug at me. I told him I'm giving him one chance. I hold up my finger and say, one. Singular. I refuse to label it. Uh. Huh. Got it. You're not labeling it, but what about him? I inch closer to her and whisper, he says he loves labels, and he's labeled himself my man. I put my man in air quotes. And he calls me his queen V. Tara puts her hands to her chest and lets out an undignified squeal. Queen V. I love it, and I know you. She points a finger at my face. You're into him, or you wouldn't be here. I think dad might be happier about it than you. He called me too and went on about you and Colt for a full 15 minutes. She crosses her arms and stares me down. Is there no privacy in this family? I lean closer and tell her about the flowers, strawberries, and the sweet notes. He's a nice guy. Great father. I think he was involved with someone after his wife died, and it didn't go well. I don't know the details, but I think she wanted him and not the kid, if you know what I mean. Then don't date a single father. I raise my voice louder than I should. Single parents are package deals. That ticks me off. If I knew the bitch, I'd go find her and give her a piece of my mind. I tell myself it's because she dismissed Evan, not because I hate the idea that Colt was with another woman not too long ago. And this likely explains why Evan is so resistant to me and his father. Yeah, 
but he got rid of her as soon as he figured that out. That kid doesn't stand a chance against you.